Three years. That's how long the Cold War has been releasing episodes. Every Saturday and some occasional weekdays, we have released an episode talking about some aspect of the Cold War. Generally, we have a running in roughly chronological format, starting from the end of the Second World War and moving forward. After three years, though, we figured we could take a little bit of time and reflect a bit on what we've done and where the channel is at now. We might also offer some thoughts on that poor, poor bell button, as well as show you some of the many, many bloopers that have occurred while filming. But no, seriously, there are a ton. I'm your host, David, and this is my slightly self-indulgent three-year recap and reflection. This is The Cold War. So, when we first started this channel, we needed to decide a starting point. The Cold War doesn't have a single event that marks the start of the conflict, and as a result, there are more than a few dates that get used depending on who you talk to. A common date that we often see is 1947, as by that time tensions between the superpowers had deepened and hardened. But we've also seen 1949 used as a starting date with the first Soviet nuclear test, as well as 1917 and the start of the Bolshevik Revolution. That one's gained some press recently thanks to one of the million or so books Jeremy Black has published in the last few years. We opted to start with the Potsdam Conference though, as that was the point where the Big Three made the decision regarding what the maps would look like and what would happen with the people that lived on various sides of the new lines. It's also where some key decisions were not made, specifically regarding Berlin, a city that acted as a linchpin for decisions and actions that were to happen over the coming decades. So that's where we started and we've been moving the narrative forward ever since. And how do we pick our topics? Well, we do have a general outline, of course, with the major talking points, events, ideas, and concepts. But like any research project, as we look at what's involved in these larger topics, we find other interesting talking points, events, ideas, and concepts that we want to explore. And it goes on from there. What this is meant though, and I know some of you have actually noticed, is that the narrative is moving along at a slower pace than some people may have anticipated when we began releasing videos. And I'll be honest, it's a slower pace than we envisioned ourselves when we started. This originally began as a three to four year project and then we'd wrap it up. Clearly, as we've only covered about 15 years of history and are still going back to old topics, this time frame was just wrong. As long as people keep watching our videos though, we are going to keep going simply because there are so many topics we can talk and educate about. And you know what, I think this is actually a good opportunity to mention that as people make topic suggestions in the comments, we do take note of them. In fact, we've actually done episodes based strictly on topic suggestions from the comments. But a quick note about these requests. While we do pay attention to them and we do consider the requests, there are a few factors we do need to take a look at. A topic needs to fit within our rough chronology. If we're covering topics from the 1950s, we aren't likely going to cover Operation Urgent Fury, the invasion of Grenada in 1983. Well, we will, just not yet. The other aspect though that we need to consider is if we can make a 15 to 20 minute video on a topic that will still be interesting to viewers. Some topics are very niche, and while fascinating for us, we want to be making videos that lots of people will still want to watch. The YouTube algorithm is a merciless mistress. But all that being said, please do suggest topics. We also get comments and questions about why so many of our videos focus on the Soviet Union. This is actually an easy one to explain. We need to start now giving and building context on what the situation in the Soviet Union was like in the 1950s and 60s in order to explain why the 1970s looked the way they did, which led to the turmoil of the 1980s, the attempts at reform, and then the actual collapse in 1991, ending the Cold War. The reforms that Gorbachev introduced were done for an enormously wide range of reasons, each of which has their own history and evolution. Glasnost and Perestroika were introduced for a reason, and we want to make sure that you, the viewer, has as much background as possible so that when we do get to the end of the series, we all have a complete picture of what happened. Now, this leads me to a subject we probably don't stress enough in any of our episodes, but is the reality of history. 
just how interconnected everything actually is. We do a 20 minute video once a week on a particular subject, and sometimes we may refer to an event or idea that we've covered in a previous video. But more and more often, as we move forward in our timeline, we produce a video where multiple events and ideas previously discussed have had a huge impact on the new subject. Nowhere so far has this been more striking than in our video on Nasser and the Pan-Arab Nationalist Movement. In just that video, we saw threads coming together from our videos on the Cento Alliance, the Suez Crisis, the 1958 Lebanon Crisis, Operation Fat F and the Non-Aligned Movement. Nothing during the Cold War happened in isolation. There was always some sort of cause and effect, whether intentional or not. This should all become more and more clear the further along we go, and yes, some of you are probably rolling your eyes and thinking, duh, we already knew that, but sometimes an explicit reminder is, you know, good for everybody. Now, in three years, I've learned a lot, and not just about the Cold War, although that's true in and of itself. Prior to this channel, I'd never done any kind of presenting, teaching, and whatnot. It's actually been almost two decades since I finished school, so getting back into a learning mode has actually been a big shift. But it's one I haven't regretted for a second. I love the learning that I get to do, and I especially love the feedback that we get when somebody shares with me that they have learned something new from one of our videos, or are even using our material in a classroom setting. It's humbling to know that there are those of you out there who value what we are able to give you and to use it to teach other people. Now, for those of you who may be interested, I figured I would describe our process once we have a topic selected. We have a group of researchers who take the topic and, along with general guidance, investigate the subject and put a script together. That script is then edited for content, either adding or removing content depending on the narrative arc we're looking for. The script is then prepped for filming, including further revisions, for both content and presentation. Once the episode is filmed, which usually includes a lot of swearing from me when I mess it up, it then moves to production where a storyboard is formed, outlining where appropriate b-roll exists and where you get to see my smiling bearded face. Once that's done, the episode is assembled and goes to revision where it's watched multiple times to look for any potential production errors. Then, and only then, is the episode ready to be published on YouTube. In total, an episode can take up to 20 to 30 hours of time from research to publication. No small feat for 20 minutes of video. This also means that episode selection happens weeks and even months in advance of release. Any episode whose subject coincides with headlines or other events really is happenstance. Now, as I get closer to finishing this little bit of self-indulgence, I just want to say that this channel is a labor of love for me and something that I do in my spare time. This is a hobby. I have a full-time job, I have a family, I have a dog that I like to take to the dog park. Bringing you videos every week is fun for me, not only because I get to learn new things all the time and am exposed to new perspectives and ideas, but I get to share that knowledge with others. Not everybody agrees with what we say, and you know what? That's fine. The study of history is not just a set of facts laid out, but is instead the interpretation of facts, of ideas, of how things are linked together and related to each other. This means that there are always going to be different ways that something is viewed, and I, and we, are happy and excited to be a part of that discourse. And we are very glad that you are here to join us on that exploration of the world's recent history. Now, with that being said, please enjoy a few minutes of me flubbing my lines. To get the item, they could deal with a Farsovic. 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 They could deal with Farsovic. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's good. Generally, if someone needed something that was unavailable in shops, or the buyer was not willing to wait for hours to get the item, they could deal with a Farsovic. I said it right too, didn't I? Yeah. Stop. And then I stopped because I didn't think I said it right because I'm used to not saying it right. Force the letter of the law and shut down the Farsov. Farsovshik. Farsovshik. Pizza. <laughs> Energy. Superstar. He was met and welcomed by President Eisenhower, where both men made courteous and welcoming remarks. Expre <laughs> <laughs> Hairball. 
With the luncheon complete, Khrushchev then attended a meeting. Mm -hmm. Senator Richard Russell, among those asking questions, Gonna do that again because I looked over at you because you've got this stupid shit eating grin. Roll it back. <laughs> that was like awesome though. <laughs> it's a great statement. It is. So close. Son of a nutcracker. No, you can't see that. Why? Nutcracker. Oh, okay. Took troubles in Central America. Central America. Trouble in Central America. Nope, gotta start that again, because I added stuff in there that isn't in the text. Although the historian, Dr. Ted B Terry. Terry Martin. Terry. Terry loves his yogurt. Terry's yogurt. Godinizatia aimed to prevent. Koronizatsia. It's like good. Coronation? Including the Crimean Tatars and Mesh... Oh, how do you say that? What's that? Meshetian? Meshetian Turks. Meshetian. Including the prominent politicians Yao U... Yao U... Yao U... Yao U... Yao U... That's good. Yeah, but you skip past it. Yeo Un Hyong and Kim Go Un Hyong. Yeo Un Hyong. Un Hyong. Yeo Un Hyong. Okay. Him to lead a transnational ship. Transnational ship? Transnational shit. 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 This sweeping reform paved the way for the latter. Ba -dum -ba -bum. The, ladder, the later. North Korea, best Korea. Three years later, the cooperative... What? Oh, shit. <sighs> I'm fucking dying on this one. It's okay. What are we eating? Eat pizza. Hey! Minya pizza. I'm full of pizza. Inostransami. Torgo... Torgovle inestransami. S is with. That Torgovle is gonna f me up. Leading into the neck can get one or the other. We hope you've enjoyed today's special episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the poor, poor bell button, which we have certainly abused over the last year. It may actually just be my favorite part of the show, telling you what's happened to it. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our supporters, and if you aren't a patron, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is The Cold War Channel, and as we think about The Cold War, I will leave you with the words of JFK. In the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Mm. <clears throat> Just crush the bell button.